taking in a little bit of peace and serenity right now because things are about to get crazy. I just touched down in Omaha, Nebraska to the home of Rick Carson and Ryan Harvey, the owners of Make Believe Studios. Now, you might know them from the Esprit's Impulse Response or the Sontec EQ. What you might not know is they have one of the sickest studios Ever. You can't even open a drawer inside this place without finding gear inside and Rick is a scientist when it comes to gear. He mods a lot of his own stuff and just because you see something that looks familiar to you doesn't actually mean it does. We're gonna have some fun with these guys over the next few days and we're gonna see if Make Believe Studios can actually make me a believer. So let's go find out. So what's happening fam? Miami here with JST and today I have two very special guests with me. Rick Carson. Ryan Harvey. And I would let them introduce themselves but we're actually gonna let the studio do the speaking. Actually, we are gonna have them talk a little bit about themselves and what brings us here in the first place. So this is Make Believe, which is probably as close as you're ever gonna get to walking through a dream I had at one point. In uh, 2014, we acquired the building and in 2016, we opened our doors and we have been running this studio for on the better side of a decade now. You know, just last year, we officially became a software company and we released some plugins out into the world and we've been meeting lots of new friends since doing that so thank you so much for coming miami dude thanks so much for having me uh you want to show me around the place a little bit this is a room that's built around a 32 channel api legacy and a beautiful acoustic space that was designed by roger vay and uh with a little bit of help from myself this room looks absolutely beautiful. So this is really the kind of space that I hope to have one day or I dream to. I do a lot of studio rentals. They all pretty much kind of look like this. Clear Lake's one that comes to mind. Fever's another one. Those are two like really popular spots out there. But yeah, let's take a look at this console. Now, which API console is this? That is an API Legacy. It is from 1994 and it was originally built for a studio down in Texas that was involved in the production of Barney and Walker, Texas Ranger. So we actually have a photo from Paul Wolf from when he built this console, a Polaroid that says the Barney console. Dude, you have a serious island of gear back here. I imagine people watching this right now are just like, oh, I know that plugin. I have something that looks like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is, this is crazy. Are these OGs? Yeah, so those Paltex are from 1952 or something like that. I don't know exact years, but they're from the 50s. One of them is uh, like serial number 105 or something. Random question. If I had to ask how much you have in gear, what would the number be? Well, how much I have invested in gear or how much the gear is? How much, is, how much the gear is worth? Ooh, I can tell you what I insure it for. <laughs> <laughs> can you? Yeah. Oh, how much? I, I carry $2 million of insurance. Jesus Christ, man. And it looks like, uh, looks like you like Marshall Lamps, huh? Um, you know, it's one of those things where for years we just had the one JCM 800 that I modified and then a flood happened where all of these really came. I mean, the 900, I guess I bought a year ago and I was just sitting in Florida at Metric Halo, but everything else came within a month. Plexi Jubilee. The Silver Jubilee. Then there's a 2000, which, you know, someone stole a bass knob on. We're watching footage, we'll find you. And then uh, the JCM 900, are modified JCM 800 and then a 22 of 300 watt JCM 800. See, I have mixed feelings about this guy. I've used it on a couple of metal albums. I'm not the biggest fan of that one specifically, but I know you can get solid stuff out of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it that is the sound of one of my favorite guitar tones ever, which we've made a video about, you know, Enema of the State's guitar tone. and That's on Enema of the State? Yes, but the thing that most people don't know about utilizing this for Tom's tone is that when Tom utilized this amp, he used it with the Mesa Boogie, which most people know. But a lot of people think that the Mesa was for the dirty and the Marshall was for the clean, or it's, you know, the Mesa was for the low end and the Marshall was for the brightness. You know, what actually ended up happening is that they utilize the clean channel on that amp and the dirty channel on that amp at the same time and that's how they got the tone but what they did was very interesting because the gain is turned all the way up so you crank the gain all the way up on the clean channel and then use that as your tone and you know with the clean channel it sounds a lot like this thing 
to be honest. A little bit brighter. There's also a mod that most people don't know about when it comes to the JCM 900, which is very, very, very simple to do. Anybody in the world can do this. So there's a problem with the way that the pre-amplifier feeds the power amplifier in a JCM 900. It's just a bad design where the level is a low level the way it is stock. So what you wanna do is just take a jumper cable, which is why we have this here, and you jumper the effects return. And yeah, yeah. a little trim pot and you can dial it in. So, you know, just right above noon is where it should be for unity and brings this amp in life. So I think there's some old Fender amps that do something similar to that. Yeah, I mean, there's not too many Fender amps that I know that have effects returns, but I'm assuming there's probably something out there like that. You know, I know there's quite a few Marshalls that that happens. I will say they tend to be from around this time period though. So the other ones that I know for sure are amplifiers like the JTM 45, the combo amp and stuff like that. They all benefit from that. But yeah, the JCM 900, this has diode clipping, correct? Yeah, and everyone wants to on the whole diode clipping, but I think that there's not enough distinction or comparison made between these two amplifiers, which, you know, that amplifier features diode clipping as well. And of course, there's ways to get around them in both of them. You can distort both of these amps without clipping diodes. You can get some really great sounds with clipping diodes. It's an interesting thing to me as well when it comes to people shitting on the whole idea of like, clipping diodes because they go and they spend like an extra grand on one of these guys and then the first thing they do is put a tube screamer in front of it and it's like okay but then you don't have a 2205 or a 2210 here though no i don't you know I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely looking for an slx you know that is a holy grail of mine as far as this whole thing is concerned but as i said to be honest dude like this is it like all of them can go this is the one and I, we did a huge shootout and we compared all of them like this is the one and i did a bunch of pre-amplifier mods on this so it can sound like a silver jubilee or it can sound like a stock and it can sound like 34 or 36 and it's got a whole bunch of other preamp mods that i did in there so I don't need any of these other ones. They're definitely cool and nice and they do sound great. All of them do. Yep. This is this is how I felt like I had a let's see, I had 5150, 5152, 5153 and what I did was made the 5154. So, my 5152, you can literally jumper between going to a 5150 and a 5152. Yep. And I think that's just like the simplest way of going about it because there's really only three components inside of it that even differ from those or those are the major ones on the lead channel. Channel. The rhythm channel is different, but most people use the lead channel anyways. So that's my 5150 and I modified the out of that thing. So it runs on two KT88s now and it has a, you know, the ability to turn on a sweepable mid so you can sweep between 200 and 4K instead of it being stuck at 700 Hertz. And it's got its own little pot for the frequency and then the mid, uh, the original mid becomes the plus and minus 15 EB. And then it's got two mods in there. One is a negative feedback loop that's called feel. And then, you know, there's another one called tighten up. And then there's a another mod in there that will switch out a few of the values in the preamplifier section with the values that are found in the dual rectifier to make it sound, you know, a little bit less fizzy and a little bit more that kind of fizzy. Hella dope. I want to see this live room. Go right ahead. So yeah, let's see what's going on in here. Well, here we are. This is a beautiful live room, I gotta say. So doing great things here. What kit do you have set up over here? This is the Q kit, which was custom built for us by Jeremy over Q Drums. He's a wonderful guy and he built this kit and then turned this into what may be known as the Gentleman series. I will say that, you know, these were all custom drums though. So they're a little bit more expensive than those, but they're very similar. That is a really nice sounding kick drum. The attack on that thing is phenomenal. Yeah, it sounds great in here. Yeah, it does sound great in here. Uh, what are some other kits that you're using? You know, so we kind of set our kits up by decade. We like to move fast here and we don't want to really f around when it comes to getting zones. So we have the Premier kit, which I tend to use for 90s. Like if I want something to sound like the 90s, I don't care if it's Fiona Apple or if it's Tool, like that kit does a really great job for that. 
and then we have the you know keystone badge ludwig kit from the 60s and you know if we're going for 60s soul and motown that is a good place to start we have the 18 inch ludwig kit that, that's a very interesting kit drum because they're very deep drums even though they're small so if i were to record periphery i would use that kit and if I were to record, you know, Sput, say on a Snoop Dogg record, I would also use that kit because it sounds like a little 808 Cannon, um, which will work for both of those. There's tons of snare drums, you know, that I would say there's way more snare drums than there are actual full drum sets up there. There's also a little Quest Love kit up there. It doesn't get used too much. These, these tend to do the heavy lift. Got a lot of guitars set up here. We record guitar stuff. Yeah, guitars and basses set up. What are some of your favorites that you have and why? Well, it really depends on what you're going for. It's same thing with all of the other stuff. For me, you know, records come with sounds, you know, so they all come from a different time period and they're kind of set up for that. And also like some of them are just like, oh, I want a sound for my favorite record. Like if I want to sound like the Beatles, there's the Hoffner and then there's the Rickenbacker. Those are the two things they're going to get you very close to the Beatles for the majority of stuff, but don't get me wrong, he also used a jazz bass. It really depends on the time period. Like if I want early Beatles, then I go Hoffner. If I want later Beatles, then I'll go to the Rickenbacker. Nothing in this is one size fits all. So same thing when it comes to this stuff. So it's kind of like what I was saying right at the front entrance. It's like the studio kind of speaks for itself. The instruments essentially are speaking for themselves. They're talking for themselves. If there's like a certain sound, you can literally just grab that thing and it's going to give you or at least put you in the ballpark of that. And it actually kind of it actually takes a lot of the analysis paralysis out of the situation because you don't have to spend time thinking about a way to get to that point. Well, you know, you see a lot of where kids will have these records where they start with a sound and then they're like well let me throw this saturator on it and let me throw this eq on it and this compressor and then i'm going to run it through this tape sim and then i hope that it sounds like this record that i love you know i'll tell you this right now if you use the right instrument with the right microphone through the right amplifier it's going to sound like the record you love like way more than any plug-in or anything else like all of those things in my mind, you get further away from important decisions the further you get down that decision-making process. And what I mean by that is like the instrument, the source is your first decision and that's the most important one and it's gonna be the biggest you know, thing. If you try and record a DW kit with 45 degree bearing edges, it's never gonna sound like Ringo, you know? So it doesn't matter what you do, you can put cotton, you know, around the rims of the drum to try and make a rounder, you know, doesn't matter. Get a Keystone badge kit, you know, <laughs> start, start with the right drum set. And then from there, get the right microphones, you know, that's the next biggest decision in my opinion. And the right microphones, it doesn't have to be the decision of like $20,000 microphones, you know, you just need to know what you're looking for. And a lot of people say, oh, I want Beatles drums, you know? And when they go and look at that, you have pretty much a couple of choices, you know, AKG D19s, which are a thousand dollars, or you can end up with something like U67s, which were used on later Beatles records. And those things are 12 grand, you know? Those things are way outside of the price point of the majority of people. But what you're truly looking for is a bright condenser or a bright dynamic microphone, you know? And if you know those things, there's, you know, AKG D190s, which are a $200 alternative. And you can mic up the whole drum set for less than a grand. And, you know, you got the Keystone badge kit, and those microphones, you're gonna be way closer to Ringo than anything you could do with plugins. Are there any other rooms that you guys have in here? As far as the studio goes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, you know, as far as in this room alone, there's a vocal booth right there. I'll be in here in a little bit. We're doing a fun little mic shootout. Check all uh, C800s up. Very familiar with uh, with this guy. Oh, so you have the treatment like built into the- Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a professionally built out studio. The wall's almost 50 inch thick, dude. 50? Look at it. Jesus Christ, dude. Yeah. You know, I don't got the luxury for that kind of space where I'm at. Well, if you uh, want to actually stop sound, mass is the only way to do it, my friends. Yeah, there's no there's no cheating that. Do you typically just leave these amps over here just set up the way that they are? And the whole room is set up. So you, you 
I'm, I'm saying in an application, if you're just recording something and then switching in and out from different artists, are you moving anything? Are you just going to leave it how it is? Well, it depends on what it is. I, you know, try and have what I want to get to ready to go, you know? So that's something that Ryan and I have worked on over the past, you know, few months. But yeah, everything in this room is set up. All these keyboards are ready to record. That organ is mic'd. All of those guitar amps are mic'd. The cabinets over there are mic'd. The piano's mic'd. The drum set's mic'd. Like, you will be f***ed tomorrow. But me, when I walk in here, people just start playing, and I can push up faders, and music comes out of the speakers. Hey, well, let's see. What else do we? What else do we have in the in the studio? Yeah, and there's two other studios. There's a whole production room. There's a closet full of stuff that people like covet. I guess. Yes, please show me. Show me around the rest of the spot. This is the kitchen, which also doubles as, you know, tech time. You can see I just picked up this tape machine. I've been working on that. People cook food here. You know, there's been projects where people will bring their own chef, and there's also some local chefs that we work with. Whirlitzers, you had another Whirlitzer in there, right? Mm -hmm. There's two Whirlitzers, two roads. I thought this was gonna, when you opened that door, I thought it was gonna be like another room the way that they This is like everything that everybody wants, you know, so space echo, stereo pair of Fender spring reverbs, there's a tube tape echo back in there, and then, you know, every pedal that's ever been invented, pretty much. That, is, that, is that an OG one? Which one? Oh yeah, I mean, there's... So you have them through the uh, arrows of them? Yeah, I actually had, you know, one of the first five that were hand wired by Mike Matthews, I sold for 4,800 bucks. Um, I bought that for $10 in a guitar amp. That's, now that's a come up. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually just sold one of the first Boss products ever. I didn't sell it. I traded it with Josh Scott for a buttload of stuff. If we're, you know, all of the uh, the Josh Scott collection. So, you know, back here is a bunch of Josh Scott pedals. And then behind that, I got to pull these out to give a shout out to my guys. I have every Earthquaker pedal. I was just about to say, because I saw the Palisades. Yeah. And I was just going to be like, yo, Earthquake, like they make, um, they make really dope stuff. Oh, they're the best. And they're the best company. It's interesting that this is how this has been arranged, because usually that is the stuff that is like right up front. But I... I'm assuming that because there's so much of it being turned, put it back there. But yeah, literally everything they do, even down to things like the Earthquaker Anniversary Edition that they did with Max on and stuff, I go out of my way if they haven't, you know, if it hasn't shown up for me, then I buy it myself because I want to support what they do. Oh, so what room is this, dude? This is my room. Oh, shit. we are in the master's layer. Yep. So this is where I work. And you see that by the dead nicotine pods on my console. How many channels is this? 24 mono channels and 16 cha stereo channels. So technically something like 44 inputs to the main channel path. But uh, I tend to use the monitor path as well. Oh, this is dope. Bro, you just, with how many consoles are in here? Three? There's technically three. This is like a tweaker's dream. Like, I mean, and by tweaker, I don't mean like a, <laughs> Yeah. I mean like an audio tweaker, like people that like to touch things, you know, like tactile. Like, yeah, man, let's make some music in here. And I thought we were going to end it, but there's actually more studio. There's more rooms. There's more. Okay, lead the way. Well, uh, you know, the other two things to really talk about is this is kind of like one of the control control hubs of the whole building, which is the machine room. Oh, dude, Jesus. Yeah, and it's kind of a rat's nest because of how I went about designing it, but I'm very happy that I did it the way that I did, which is that all of my interfaces for my rig show are back here, so they're very easy to go and calibrate. Yeah, these are the power supplies for all the consoles in the studio, and they all show up here, and then we've got some stuff like that's digitally controlled. We just leave back in these racks. Instantly got warmer the second I came over here, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like 10 degrees warmer once you pass that door. And then the other spot, to talk about really is this room which used to be the vocal booth for studio d and has now been converted into you know a writing space people will just come in here and set up their laptop and we've got tons and tons of vintage synths and you know some more modern stuff from the roland boutique line and it's just all hooked up through midi and all connected through that npc so you can literally just scroll through vintage synth sounds oh dude this is dope dude producers rent the spot out no, no, I, this is a private studio at this point. So, you know, there's not too many people that we like let in here. Oh, okay. But dude, thanks so much for showing me around. This has been great. And I'm really excited to continue doing the videos that we're doing in here. Uh, I never get to really have this much space and this much stuff to play around with. So I think it's going to be a treat for everybody that's watching that. Make sure that you stay tuned because it's going to get really wild. Okay, well, let me ask you, what are you most excited about? I think tinkering with gear that I've never touched before. I'm big on using hardware. I go in and out of studios that have the standard things that you see, but there's things that I don't recognize. And for me, that's rare. 
What? what caught your eye? I couldn't tell you because I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew what it was, then I would have probably have used it by that. You know what I mean? So it's it's more so stuff like that. It's like, okay, what is that? I'm not even familiar with that. So it's gonna be more more like one of those things. And I think it might be something I might mess around with on drum tracking day, which is gonna be tomorrow. And that should be a lot of fun. If you're an engineer on the come up, make sure to give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. You only have to do it one time and tap that bell for notifications so when a video drops you know the location until next time my friends i'll catch you later